We have over 600 people who have registered, people here from all over the uh, United States and from other parts of the world as well. Um, I really want to thank my team, which we'll talk about in just a minute, for um, helping put this together. And so many of you provided feedback on both getting ready for the summit and in the past year as we have met with many people around the country. So when we talk about hope or healthy outcomes from positive experiences, we have in mind a specific vision. We're looking to making a path towards a world that recognizes, honors, and fosters positive experiences because they're fundamental to lifelong health and well-being. We have a wonderful team uh, that's put together to do this. There's um, myself, um, Jeff Lincolnback from the Montana Institute, who has been with us from the very beginning um, and continues to introduce us to people um, around the country and to be an active uh, contributor to the content of hope. My colleague, Dr. Baraka Floyd, a pediatrician at Stanford, um, <clears throat> who has been, I've been working with her for years and who joined the HOPE team this year. Our project director, Dina Burstein, who has spent most of the year planning for today's meeting. Amanda Wynn, who just joined us, she uh, lives in Oregon and she's our West Coast project manager. Chloe Yang, our senior research assistant, and many of you have seen many emails from her as she's literally been working night and day to make this forum happen. And Lauren McCullough, a research mm -hmm. assistant who joined us last year, who's also been with us every step of the way, um, particularly as we gather new information from around the country. And Lauren's helped us synthesize that. So hope exists because we know that positive experiences help children grow into resilient, healthier adults. And what we're doing with the HOPE project is we aim to evolve our understanding and support of these key experiences. This is not an easy thing to do because HOPE is a paradigm shift in how we as providers see and talk about the positive experiences that support children's growth and development into healthy, resilient adults. Um, Hope started uh, a while ago. I know uh, Jeff Lincoln back and I and others were at a variety of meetings and really started talking about what it is that children need. And we came up with an editorial at the time that the CDC launched Essentials for Childhood. Um, and this was published in Pediatrics in 2014. Um, and now hope is spreading. The people I mentioned on the uh, slide before were the Hope National Resource Center. We have a Hope Innovation Network, which is a group of practices and organizations around the United States that are putting hope into the work they do with children and youth every day. And we also owe a lot to our Hope partner organizations. And we'll be talking about with them and about them a lot um, throughout these sessions today. Today's talk, there are really three ideas that I'm going to talk about. Um, science of hope, the building blocks of hope, hope and adversity, and then we'll be talking about the spread of hope. So just to start out at the beginning with what is a healthy outcome? So healthy outcomes is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this is the World Health Organization definition. It's also what I think my mother meant when she said, she brought me a new shirt, and she said, wear it in good health. But all the definitions are cultural. And a Navajo definition includes not only mind and body, but also harmony with our surrounding environment. Positive experiences are so important. They promote long-term health and well-being. They allow children to form relationships and connections and a sense of belonging and what my colleague Charlene Harper Brown calls a sense of mattering. And it helps us all build skills to cope with stress. For some of you, this next section is a review. Um, others, it's new. So please bear with me for just a moment as we go through some of the research evidence behind 
the positive childhood experiences. The seminal study was one um, that we started with the help of Jennifer Jones and Jeff Lincolnback as part of the Wisconsin Positive Community Norms Project. We added questions about positive childhood experiences to the 2015 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey in Wisconsin that already asked about ACEs. And then we had those results. We compared that with the um, respondents' current mental health. Here are the elements of the positive experiences scale. Um, how often, as a child, did you feel able to talk to your family about your feelings? How often did you feel your family stood by you during difficult times? How often did you enjoy participating in community traditions? How often did you feel a sense of belonging in high school? How often did you feel supported by friends? And how often did you have more than one adult other than your parents who took a genuine interest in you? And did you feel safe and protected by an adult in your home? These questions were modified from, an or from a survey created for the World Health Organization um, by Dr. Dr. Unger in Canada and has been used around the world. We chose that as our starting place um, because it's been used for people in different cultures in different parts of the world and is well validated um, in all of those environments. So here's what we found. Positive childhood experiences protect adult mental health. Those adults in Wisconsin who had six or seven positive childhood experiences had a 72% lower odds of depression or poor mental health. Those with three to five of the seven possible experiences had a 52%. And those of you who are familiar with survey research know that this is a very large result. And I just wanna mention that we're indebted to uh, Dr. Bethel and her colleagues at the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Institute who took our results, analyzed them, and developed what we now call the PCE scale. And Dr. Bethel was the first author in the paper that reported that scale and these results. But here's the thing. We all know that adverse childhood experiences, the experience of being abused or neglected or living in a household with severe challenges can affect one's health physically and mentally. So what happens when we look not at the whole population of Wisconsin, but at just those people who had four or more ACEs? And here, the results are just as dramatic. If we look at people with four or more ACEs, if they had six or seven positive childhood experiences, they had a 21% chance of depression or poor mental health compared to those who had zero, one, or two who had over 60%. And people with a middle number had a middle result. So here's the take-home lesson from this. The take-home lesson is that when we only think about deficits or adversity or trauma or toxic stress, we're missing part of the picture. And part of the picture in understanding ourselves and the people we work with is understanding their complete history including positive experiences. Now, we talked about this at the individual level. And um, Wendy Ellis and her colleagues at George Washington have reminded us that all of these experiences happen in an environment that's filled with inequity and racial injustice and other kinds of problems. And Wendy and her team at George Washington developed what we call the pair of ACEs, adding adverse community environments to our understanding of these individual experiences. So poverty, discrimination, community disruption, lack of opportunity, lack of quality housing, and violence all give rise to the individual problems that become labeled as adverse childhood experiences. And not only are we carrying that message in what we do, but we're thinking about, about it constantly in what are the community and family environments that set children up to have adverse experiences or positive experiences. So I talked to you a moment ago about what health is. Now let's talk about what the building blocks of hope are, or specifically, what do we mean when we say positive experiences? So 
we looked at this um, with the help of Charlene Harper Brown, who led this study, and determined that there are four building blocks of hope relationships, <clears throat> environment, engagement, and opportunities for emotional growth. Adverse childhood experiences happen when these positive experiences are blocked. So we know that child abuse and neglect hurts partly for the physical reasons, but mostly because it disrupts the foundational relationships that children can experience. It disrupts a safe home environment. And family challenges and disruption disrupts the safe environment um, at the home and through um, problems with the social determinants of health, which include family violence. Adverse community environments reduce opportunities for child and family engagement and reduce opportunities for emotional growth. Because as we'll be talking about in a few minutes, those opportunities happen through peer play, which basically requires a safe physical and social environment. So those are the positive childhood experiences. How do they work? And we now know that positive childhood experiences can result in changes in the brain. They can help us heal. And we're beginning to gain an insight into the fundamental science of how positive childhood experiences literally affect our brains. So just a couple of sample studies. The first one is meditation. So the practice of meditation causes brain changes. In this study by Kwok et al., they looked at teaching people to meditate versus another intervention, which was really basically how to relax. They found functional improvement that after the learning to meditate, um, people had improved mindfulness and resilience using standard psychological tests. But the purpose of this slide today is that it caused changes in brain function, something called functional connectivity, how well different parts of our brain connect to each other um, using something called functional MRI. Pretty amazing that a short course in meditation and the practice of meditation can cause brain changes. Also, for those of us who work with children, we all know about Reach Out and Read and other programs that try to teach children to love books. But look what happens to the brain when people learn to read. In these studies, they did a before and after evaluation of illiterate adults as they learned to read. And they found that the acquisition of literacy, learning to read, is associated with reinforcement of connections between two parts of the brain. The part of the brain that decodes vision. So when our eyes report back to the brain, there's a part that allows us to see, and the part of our brain that makes word associations and allows us to speak. So when someone learns to read, you can actually see physical changes in the brain that link these two important brain centers together. Um, but I also wanna talk about healing because many of us in this room um, work with people who had histories of trauma, who have difficulties, and we are convinced through our own work that healing is possible. And it turns out it is. And there's modern brain science that goes to what's called brain plasticity, which is simply the ability of a brain to change its structure in response to damage. So what this set of uh, slideshow is <clears throat> activity in the brain. And you can see on the one on the left, whoops, sorry about that. On the left-hand side, that when I, a person moves one hand, for example, when I move my right hand, my left brain lights up, and you can see not much is going on on the same side as my hand. Imagine a person who had a stroke and then had therapy based both on activity and on thinking. Cognitive-based therapies are really having to do with visualization, thinking about how to recover. And when that happens, you can see that although this stroke and this person damaged the part of the brain that used to be all lit up, there's new parts of the brain that light up. So our brains can literally rewire after a stroke. Now, most of us work with psychological trauma, not with physical trauma. 
is there evidence that brains can recover after psychological trauma? And the answer is yes. Positive experiences help healing and recovery. These studies were done in Japan after a severe earthquake, and they looked at something called post-traumatic brain growth. And it's characterized by positive psychological changes resulting from major life crises or traumatic events. And we all know that many people can recall a trauma and then learn life lessons from that and feel that they came out different and in some ways better as a result of their learning. So here's what we know. When you look at recovery, it also has to do with resilience and it causes changes in the brain that people who had higher scores in post-traumatic brain growth actually had higher activation of the region of our brain that's responsible for executive functioning. So these and other studies demonstrate that our brains can heal after physical or psychological trauma, which is amazing. And what that means is that history is not destiny, that there are other things that happen to us in addition to the adversity, toxic stress, and other problems that can allow us to heal. This is how it works. So if you think about how traffic works, um, when there's a lot of traffic between two places, we end up building a superhighway. And what a superhighway does is it allows cars to move fast and bypass some of the local roads and get to our destinations. And for the moment, let's just ignore traffic jams, okay? Um, but this is how the brain works too. That an ordinary brain cell, shown here on the left, sends a signal from the brain cell down to the end, and that signal goes slowly and sometimes dissipates before it gets to the end. When a connection is used a lot, the brain forms insulation called myelin, and that insulation not only speeds the signal on its direction, but also increases the intensity. So the more we use a connection between one brain cell and another, the more direct and fast that connection will become, not because the brain cell has changed, but because the other cells in our brain facilitate that change. And if you think about this, what I have in this picture are two neurons. Each of us has billions, literally billions of neurons. Each neuron has up to 10,000 connections. So if you think about it, billions of neurons, tens of thousands of connections, multiply that times multiple connections, and you get to a really, really, really big number. And what that means is because our brains can change wiring, there is a huge capacity for healing. And part of this happens <clears throat> because of the experiences we have. And one of the things that we all know um, is that in addition to having fight or flight reactions that, that causes the release of stress hormones, if we're lucky, we also fall in love. And I'm going to put out there that each of us was born. And the first person we fell in love with is probably the person who gave birth to us. And there's a hormone called oxytocin. And it's really special because we've known for a long time that it supports childbirth and lactation. But we also know now <clears throat> that oxytocin release spikes the childbirth in all parents, regardless of their gender, after the birth of their child whether they were the parent who gave birth or the non-gestational parent. And synchronous release promotes affiliative interactions. I love that because what that means is when people fall in love, they have oxytocin spikes at the same time. Pretty cool. So it means that there's a biological mechanism that promotes making those connections and it's associated deeply with our relationships with others. So when we say we're in sync, we're literally in sync. So I want to move now to a discussion of the four building blocks of hope and put them in some context of other things um, that we also know. So first of all, just a shout out to Charlene Harper Brown um, from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. And she led this review that we did. We looked at programs that work for children and youth and tried to figure out from all of those programs what did they have in common? 
And we came up with four categories, which gave rise to the four building blocks of hope. Relationships with other children and adults through activities, safe, equitable, stable environments for living, playing, learning, both at home and in school, social and civic engagement that helps us develop a sense of belonging and connection and emotional growth through playing and interacting largely with peers that can lead to self-awareness and self-regulation. So relationships begin at the moment of birth and we, and we, we have attachment to the person who gave birth to us. Shortly thereafter, we develop attachment to other close caregivers. Then as we get older, we become aware of other children and peers. And what we know, for example, and we, what we talked about in setting up the PCE scale is the importance of adults who care about children other than their parents, that these relationships are foundational importance to our development. And the whole field of early relational health and infant mental health really focus on these important relationships, which at the beginning of life set the pattern for our close relationships later. All of us need a safe, equitable, and stable environment to live, learn, and play. Some of this are what we now call the social determinants of health, which simply means that children need food in their belly and a roof over their head and a place to sleep. But beyond that, we also know that they need a psychologically safe environment. There's a whole movement now towards creating positive school environments where every child feels valued and every child feels valued because the teachers feel valued and the school runs in a way that becomes a community. So if you notice on the positive childhood experience scale or PCE scale, the question wasn't what grades did you get in school? The question was, did you feel a sense of belonging in school? What a difference. So having that safe environment is a key importance. Engagement. Social and civic engagements develop a sense of belonging and connectedness. And this picture taken before the pandemic um, is of the young people at Artists for Humanity who created the HOPE logo and the HOPE color palette that we've been using. These teenagers are a really important part of the Boston community. When you see posters around town, chances are AFH and those high school students had something to do with it. We know for teenagers that having a sense of engagement, feeling like they matter because they're in a choir or on a sports team or doing art or helping out other people in their communities or being involved in politics matters. But this sense of connection and engagement begins very early. For example, with kindergartners who are given classroom chores and know that the community depends on them to do those things. Finally, children need opportunities for emotional growth. And I know many of us, myself included, are concerned about the lack of peer experiences that had happened because of the pandemic. Because we know that emotional growth happens when children interact with each other. And we could go on and on and talk about this. It's not always without friction, but the, but the way we learn socially is the way we do anything else. It's through practice and through having those opportunities. But these are the four kinds of experiences that we know um, lead to healthy, resilient children. So how do you think about this? Because many of us have been involved in other programs and oh my God, all we need is another model. Carl Bell, may he rest in peace, uh, famously said, models are like toothbrushes. Everyone, have, everyone has one, everyone uses one, everyone hopes other people use them, but at the end of the day, we each want to use our own. So does hope add to these models or is it just another thing to think about? And the way we think about hope is it complements other programs and efforts that are going on. Hope focuses on positive childhood experiences, a counterbalance to adverse childhood experiences, and is firmly situated at the child level of social ecology. Programs like strengthening families look at the family that creates the environment in which the child grows up. What does that family need? What do successful families, what strengths do they have? And how can we help them have those strengths? Programs like Help Me Grow and Early Childhood Systems 
provide community supports for families and programs like Essentials for Childhood and the Montana Institute's work on positive community norms set up an environment that allows these systems to work, that helps families, that helps children have these positive experiences. So these things are not in competition. These are different ways of looking at the same set of positive experiences. There's a lot of research supporting hope. And these are a few of the articles, including uh, some that came out quite recently, um, some from um, our Dr. Bethel, who will be here this afternoon, that talk about all the things that we've looked into. So when we've talked about it so far, it's true. And there's a lot of stuff going on from long before there was hope. Um, the basics, and Dr. Ron Ferguson is part of our advisory board, set up a program to help families help their children have cognitive development before they enter school. I've already alluded to reach out and read. Um, and we know the importance of positive childhood experiences and early relational health very acutely in the case of infants when they're born early or otherwise sick. The latest advance in modern science is the oldest thing that we've ever known, which is skin-to-skin -skin contact, holding a child, helps regulate their heart, helps regulate their respirations, helps them heal. So even with all of our technology, the latest, most important change in neonatology in the past few years has been understanding the importance of early relational health on the physical growth of vulnerable infants. So think about that, how important all of these things are, even for kids who were born early and have so many other problems. So the way we work at HOPE is we identify ways that communities and systems of care can better ensure that all children have positive experiences. And we do this using a path to transformation, and we're going we're gonna to break this apart. We try to change practice, do research, build public will, build a movement for HOPE, support community action, and in the end of the day, shift the narrative. So it's not all about people and their deficits. It's all about people. So when we collaborate, we work with organizations that work with children and families, um, allied organizations like networks, including um, Healthy Families America, child and family serving providers. And many of you today are in that group. Researchers, people who are going to help expand the knowledge base, child and family advocates, including people who do substance abuse counseling for teenagers and family advocates who work within the child welfare system, and equally importantly, policymakers, so that we can work together to create policies that help ensure that children have positive childhood experiences. And what does that mean? Simple example, paid family and medical leave, which is ticking off around the country, allows families to form those early foundational relationships without the economic stress and the compromises that people have to make if there's not paid leave. So think about the link between the child's positive experience of relationship and the policy that allows it. So we've worked with a lot of people and over the past year, we've had more than 50 sessions with more than 10,000 providers and, and managers in different organizations. In home visiting, we've looked at eating, breastfeeding, and attachment. We've looked at playing and growth, the importance of helping parents of young children just play with their kids and watch them, and centering joy, relationship, and importantly, parental mental health. It's not all about the baby. It's all about the relationship. When we talk with pediatrics, we're talking about fostering social emotional health, an important part of pediatric practice. What are health-related social needs and how can the health clinic help people get the resources to support children's playing and growth? And increasingly in pediatrics, there's attention to parental mental health and resilience, starting with issues like maternal depression near birth, but continuing an active interest in a two-generation model in pediatrics, all of which is new and all of which benefits from coordinated approaches that are expanding our idea of what is a person-centered 
medical home and who works there. In education, <clears throat> beginning with early childhood education and continuing through K, through K to 12, how do we create opportunities for emotional growth? And kids data collects information about that for school children in California. How do we create a sense of mattering? Every child who attends school should feel that they matter. They matter to the teacher, they matter to each other, and they matter to the school. What can schools do to promote that? And finally, equity-informed school conduct policies. And I mentioned that we've been doing a lot of seminars and workshops with people. One of the things that led us the, to the greatest joy was when after a couple of meetings with the school district, we found out from their leadership that they had undertaken a complete revamping of their student conduct policies to take into account the health effects of positive experiences. What a change and what that means for equity and human development when we start to work in, in that very fraught area. I mentioned that because I wanna set up for you that what we're doing with HOPE is beyond pediatrics, it's beyond early childhood education, it's everything. It's a frame shift in how we think. And this is really hard to put into practice. So um, with the help of Judy Langford, who's facilitating it, we now have a group of six practices around the country that are beginning to explore what it means to become a hope-informed organization and to have hope inform the way they work. So we have two clinics, one in Maine and one at Stanford. Um, we have an after-school program in Minnesota and a daycare program in San Diego and um, home visiting programs in St. Louis and in Massachusetts that are looking at what it means what do you do with your intake forms? What do you need for your training? How do you get parents involved? What kind of assessments? How do you know whether it works? So we're going through a learning community where we're learning together, moving from these concepts and the four building blocks of hope, rolling up our sleeves and seeing what it looks like in practice and importantly, how it affects the parents and families we serve. We're trying to expand knowledge. So part of it is we have our own evaluators. We have an evaluation team from uh, called TIER, um, led by Ann Easterbrooks and, um, and her team that are helping us understand. Beyond that, we're looking at surveys, at basic science, and increasingly figuring out how to incorporate parent voice in everything we do. So here's something that we just found out recently. Together with the American Academy of Pediatrics and Prevent Child Abuse America, we are conducting surveys of American parents. The first um, batch of surveys was done in November, and we asked parents in the United States, what is the experience of helping your child with their education? How does that work? What does it do for you? And we found that, no surprise, 80% of children's lives were disrupted, Six in 10 school age children had schools that were completely closed at the time of this survey. What we found was that many parents, um, and in this study, about half of parents, 50%, 60%, I'm sorry, reported some level of stress. And 76% reported that helping their child with their education created opportunities for deepening relationships and positive experiences. And many, many families reported simultaneously positive experiences and stress. So think about that. If you go back a minute, I spoke about post-traumatic brain growth. One of the things that happens after trauma is those relationships become deeper. We're seeing that in American parents. Most U.S. children have experienced disruptions. School disruptions cause tension and distress in the family. Despite this, families have grown together. And what HOPE is doing is adding to our understanding. We know parents are stressed, but now what we're adding is they're also having positive experiences. Um, as far as public wheel building, um, we've been around the country. We've been all over. These are a couple of um, items from, the, um, from earned media. We've done this locally and around the country to try to, find, to, try to get the message out um, that as we said with Melissa Merrick from um, PCAA, parents have a right to be stressed, 
shouldn't take it out on their kids. And as that article went on, we talked about the relationships between parents and kids um, during the stress. Communication. So many of you have been part of our direct outreach. We've had 50 events, 10,000 attendees. We have a newsletter that reaches about 1,000 people. We have a website. Most recently, we had 40,000 views and 20,000 viewers. And through our partners, we're cross-posting our information with what is now called PACES Connection, with EC Connector, and with our friends at CSSP. So we are working very hard on movement building through communication. We're also seeking to address racist systems. <clears throat> we have blog posts and we give time and space to thoughtful discussions about how systemic racism affects children and families. We're building issues of racial justice into our evaluation metrics. We're working very hard to create practical tools to inform racial justice. And we're having difficult conversations with our team, with our national advisory board, and around the country. There is nothing easy about addressing centuries of racism in the United States. And part of this comes from our guiding principles. So our guiding principles for positive transformation include three that are specifically around equity and racism. We seek to create equitable conditions for health and well-being so that all families and children have a, the opportunity to thrive. And I think that this hopefully goes for many of us in this room. Our lives are richer and we celebrate our differences as our collective strength. And whenever possible, we speak out against racism and stereotypes because they inflict harm. And honestly, each of us has our own experiences, professional, our own life experience. And the only way to engage in the struggle for racial justice is to act with humility, respect, and gratitude for others um, who share with us and everything we say and do to make time and space um, for that. As we're moving deeper, we're looking at questions like how are people who are most impacted see the issues we're dealing with? What are the key positive childhood experiences in a cultural context? When um, Dr. Harper Brown and I looked at the review of literature, we tried to be as open-minded as we could, but we could only look at things that came from standard evaluations. So how can we co-create that with families who have lived experience and how can we learn beyond the standard evaluations and surveys? to make our positive childhood experiences um, be truly meaningful and relevant to the lives of so many people. Finally, we're working to shift the narrative and we're doing this through organizational collaborations. We're working very closely with the Montana Institute with Prevent Child Abuse America and its affiliate, Healthy Families America. We are delighted that in our own state, we have a big project going on with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and our DPH to prevent adverse childhood experiences. And our logic model is by building up stronger families and positive childhood experiences, we can prevent adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. We're working closely with the American Academy of Pediatrics and also with the CDC, who's not only funding some of our specific efforts, but has really become a thought partner in understanding how we can use public health techniques to better understand healthy outcomes from positive experiences. The goal of all this is to change the narrative. So when family and community serving agencies meet with someone, they think not only about their deficits and what can we screen for and what professional services, but what strength and resilience do families bring to it? How can we help families do what they think is most important which is creating these positive experiences for their children as they grow. That's a change in narrative that arises from the spirit that brings us all into the work we do, but can sometimes get drowned out in the day-to-day -day work um, because the narrative of our work life needs to change. And I'm really happy to report to you that hope is spreading through direct outreach. We've reached many people. Many of you here have heard some of this before. Um, we have an innovation network. We're co-developing organizational change. And this, um, this month, April, is 
Prevent Child Abuse Month and Prevent Child Abuse America and Healthy Families America have a campaign to prevent child abuse. And look what's on their homepage. Show support for positive childhood experiences for all children. Doesn't get any better or more true than that. Because as Prevent Child Abuse America says, we all know that childhood lasts a lifetime. We're working with, uh, in California, and we have a number of efforts, and uh, Baraka Floyd and Amanda Wynn are our staff members on the West Coast, and we were delighted that HOPE was called out in the recent Surgeon General's report called Roadmap for Resilience. And on a national level, um, when the Maternal and Child Health Bureau published the 2021 Prevention with Purpose, there was a three-page description of healthy outcomes from positive experiences. And this happens because of our strategy of working behind the scenes with our partners, with people who think and work every day to promote healthy childhoods, to prevent child abuse and neglect, to promote strong families. And we've had the pleasure of working with people all around the country on this, sometimes through direct outreach and sometimes by helping these organizations do their own missions and using the, um, the views from healthy outcomes from positive experiences, help them do their work. And we're working really hard to reach beyond ourselves. And we're beginning to see things like the ACES Connection changed its name to PACES Connection for positive and adverse, child, and adverse childhood experiences. We have an editorial coming up in Pediatrics, the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, that really calls out reasons for hope in 2021. And we're working together to create positive experiences for toddlers and preschool age children. Um, in this case, using information that families can obtain directly from the American Academy of Pediatrics HealthyChildren.org website. All of these things are beyond our direct reach, people we've never meet, we never talk to, um, through publications statewide and national efforts. But I wanna switch now, and that's all about what we've been doing. But each of the people who are here today, there are more than 300 of you listening right now. Um, there are more who are gonna be joining us as the day goes on. And I'd like to call for action. Um, you can learn about HOPE. You can visit our website called positiveexperience.org. You can download materials there. We're creating resources all the time. We now have resources for parents in English and Spanish. We have professional resources, including videos where we simulate encounters with patients or clients and showing how just by changing what's between our ears, we can do a better job of doing the work that we do because we can include asking about the four building blocks of hope in every patient encounter. And I'm really delighted to announce that you know, later in April, certainly by the end of April, we're going to launch an online learning management system. So you'll be able to learn about HOPE using uh, an online curriculum developed by our partners, the Education Development Center. Um, and this will allow you not only to learn about HOPE, but if you're an organizational leader, you can send your staff there so that everyone who works in an organization can know about the four building blocks and can have given some thought into how to tweak their practice, to include identifying, honoring, and expanding positive childhood experiences, because we know that those are the key to health outcomes. Also, after today's summit, share, tell your colleagues um, about what you've learned. We're gonna have a ton of resources, including um, from today's summit, you can send people to. Encourage your agency to work with us, sign up for a workshop, talk to us about how to implement hope wherever it is you work. Also, act, <clears throat> sign up for a train the trainer program. We just, just launched the anti-racism toolkit and that's because some people don't have access to the positive childhood experiences. And this toolkit um, includes things like when you have a child who's in danger of being expelled from preschool, which we know is a disaster for the child and the family, even though the child's behavior may be difficult. What can you do 
to fundamentally change that system so the child and family are supported and the child's beha behavior is a moment for intervention and support and not a moment for being kicked out of the community. All of those things we know are important and take action and take listening. And we encourage you to look at that and let us know. We'd also like you back at your own work to take a look at your intake and assessment forms. Do you ask about people's strengths? Is there an option to think about that? So for example, if you have a child who was a substance exposed newborn, have you asked the mother about how she got into recovery, what her pregnancy was like, what she had to do to maintain custody of the child at birth, when in many states, the Child Welfare Agency um, could be very challenging at that moment? And how has she stayed in recovery? And what helps her do that? Learning about her strengths and resilience can form the foundation for an environment where not only do you understand someone, but often in my experience has been, you find things in our clients or patients to admire. So think about that compared to a setting where all you know is that an infant was exposed to substances before birth. And it doesn't mean that you ignore all the problems. It means you understand them in the context of a whole person with strengths and resilience and challenges. So think about that. How do you do an intake? How do you assess people? Do you allow room to understand strength and resilience and to partner with families to help create those positive experiences that we know children need? I wanna finish my talk by leaving you <clears throat> with an image. In some ways, <clears throat> people are like trees. We all carry our past with us. And many of us, when we were in elementary school, we saw tree rings and you could see this was a year of a lot of rain, this was a drought. But more than that, if you look at living trees, they're complicated. They have structures. Many trees live in forests and forests may have an intergenerational, even cross species group of trees living in harmony together. Many trees have experienced trauma, and sometimes that trauma is recent and even life-threatening. Sometimes the trauma is old and the tree is healed. People are like that too, aren't we? Some trees don't live in forests, but live all on their own. And if you look really closely, maybe that tree has been transplanted. Maybe it was born somewhere else and brought to a new environment where it's now thriving. I mean, think about the people we know and what's happened to them to get them to be who they are now. Sometimes after all this, um, trees, particularly older trees, older people have a lot to offer. We can admire them. We can look at them and just stand in awe of what they've been through and try to figure out how they got to be the shape that they are now and to offer us um, the beauty and shade that they do. What is it that, that allows people to take those experiences and become an object of learning and admiration? As I finish this plenary address and get ready to introduce my friend and colleague, Daryl Armstrong, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect and think about each other, our clients, what makes us tick, how we're the same, how we're different, and how each of us embodies our experiences as we grow to adulthood. So with this reflection, I think we have a couple of minutes where um, we can have some question and answer and discussion. I wanna just close by um, thanking uh, my colleagues at Tufts Children's Hospital and the Tufts Clinical Translational Science Institute for their um, undaunting support and the JPB Foundation for providing core uh, funding for HOPE.